All right, hi everyone. Uh, switching up my location a little bit today. Uh, I'm gonna start this week uh, off with content area three. So this is early Europe and colonial Americas. We split this into a bunch of different units. We looked at uh, a medieval unit, we looked at the Renaissance, uh, we looked at Baroque, New Spain, all of that is kind of tied into this area. Uh, but for today, we're gonna be looking at the first video Topics for this are early Christianity, um, Islam. We're really only looking at Islam in the European area. Uh, the rest of it would be considered uh, Asian, and so unfortunately it's cut out of the curriculum uh, for this crazy year. Uh, Byzantine, Romanesque, and Gothic. So let's get started. Remember, as we go through this, having a notebook out, having questions that you can write down, or also recording things that maybe you need to go back and look at more would be really helpful. All right, so how do we get from ancient Rome to Byzantium? Uh, so the fourth century, Constantine, who's a Roman emperor, endorses Christianity uh, in Rome and kind of endorses it over the pagan gods, but they're still allowed at that point. Uh, he starts to fund lots of Christian buildings, so all of a sudden all kinds of churches and Christian construction is beginning, and also founds Constantinople. Uh, Christianity also becomes the state religion. Now this is after Constantine dies, uh, but it eventually becomes the state religion. And then eventually the ban of the old Roman gods is uh, their banned. All right, so the fifth century CE, uh, this is when the emperor uh, emperorship starts to become really tumultuous. Uh, we have a lot of outside threats, so they're warring on multiple sides. Uh, I'm just thinking you guys might be able to hear this baby monitor, so I'm going to turn it down. All right, so uh, there's a lot of fighting, empires are kind of collapsing, and all of a sudden the empire is split into east and west. So the eastern Christian Roman Empire is Byzantium. Uh, and then one other little point here in the 15th century, so way later, this is when the Const Constantinople falls to the Ottoman Empire, and that's when a lot of churches are converted into mosques. So Hagia Sophia, which we'll talk about, uh, starts off as a church built in Constantinople, uh, and then eventually, uh, when the Ottomans take over, it becomes a mosque, and then eventually a museum. All right, moving on. Early Christianity. So both of these we looked at in our faith unit. So Santa Sabina is an early Christian church, and the catacombs of Priscilla are places where Christians were buried at first. Uh, so some things with early Christian churches. Um, they took the basilica form, which remember we saw in the form of Trajan with the uh, basilica Ulpia, and the main form was to have this long rectangle that we see here with an apse on either side with basilica Ulpia. In this case, they took what they needed from that original basilica plan, and in this case they only have the one apse, which then delineates where the focal point in the church should be. So that apse is that curved space. If we look here, we see it's got a curved area in the roof, so it's a great place for imagery, and then down below would be the pulpit where there might be sermons. Um, other things to notice, we have the columns all along the side. This allows to separate space, so we have the nave in the middle. This would be where people would gather uh, for services. We have the aisles on the sides for people to move about. Uh, this also allows, you can see there are windows up above, so it allows for that clear story lighting. Uh, they would also use a lot of mosaics too, and that would be a way to get imagery, Christian imagery, into the space as well. Uh, the catacombs, remember they're Christian burials. These would be, there'd be tons and tons of hallways, tons and tons of uh, layers in the ground, and so bodies would actually be in these loculi. Uh, sometimes there would also be cubiculum, which would be um, rooms that would be dedicated to more wealthy people, and those smaller rooms would also have imagery fresco painted like we see right up here. All right, moving on, let's talk more about Byzantium. Um, and we can look at more of the style that we see in early Byzantine um, style. 
Okay, so if we start with San Vital here, uh, we have an interior shot, we have the ground plan and an exterior, and then we have these two panels. We have Justinian in the center here helping with the Eucharist ceremony, and then we have Theodora over here helping with the Eucharist as well. Now, this is a different, it's a centrally planned church. So this is after that original basilica plan, then they started to kind of modify things um, as they, they needed. So there would be an entry point over here. Then they would go in and they've got this nice ambulatory. This is a place where they can walk around. And then the pulpit, the apse, would be here. Uh, and so the panels that we see, the Justinian and Theodora panels, would be right here. So as people are sitting and looking, they see those panels in addition to this central place. So we see that on the map here. We see the uh, mosaics up above. So these are both pictorial fiction. So Justinian uh, was an emperor uh, at the time, and uh, he never actually came to Ravenna, where San Vital is. So instead, this is pictorial fiction, so it's not actually true that he came. But by placing himself and his wife in the church, it's a way to uh, basically show that he has the right to rule and that he has the power over the church and the state. Now if we look at the style a little bit, remember this is a mosaic, so it's different than Roman mosaics because they're using tesserae that are glassy and shiny. They also put them at angles so that they glitter. Uh, you can see some basic things that separate it from the style of Roman, um, specifically if we look back at the uh, Alexander mosaic. Uh, they're, stylistically, things are very frontal, very stiff. There's really only one ground line. The background is gold, um, just very simple. And even if you look at the way the feet are, they're not really realistic. So at this time, they're not really caring as much about making things naturalistic and making things believable. Um, style is more important, and sometimes just using imagery is important. So it's not that they weren't capable of creating stronger uh, representation. It's that they just didn't really want to. All right. So then if we move across here and we look at the Virgin Theotokos and Child between Saints Theodore and George, uh, this is a really important piece because there aren't many like it anymore that are around. So this is an icon painting. Uh, it's done with encaustic, so waxes on wood, and it's small. It's something that could be carried around and taken into the home. So icons were used to help people worship in their home, worship more often. The problem was during this time, uh, icons became something that a lot of Christians disagreed with completely, which led to iconoclasm, which I know is a word that we've talked about and looked at with multiple cult cultures. Um, for the Christian iconoclasm, things like this would be destroyed because they were considered false idols. So if people were worshiping to this icon of Theotokos and the saints, uh, then they weren't actually worshiping to Theotokos. Instead, it was um, worshiping to a false version. So that's why they were destroyed. Stylistically, this is great to show Byzantium too. We have limited background. Um, it doesn't really make sense the way the figures are behind. Uh, and also, you can see there's some uh, curves in the draping, but things are very stiff, very frontal, uh, very simple depictions of the people. Okay, let's move back out here. Moving on, we already talked about Hagia Sophia a little bit, uh, but remember in the 6th century when Constantinople, it was created in the 6th century, right after Constantinople existed. Uh, remember this is now Istanbul, uh, but this map is really helpful when we start to talk about uh, the Islamic move into Europe. Uh, so we'll look at that, but let's talk about Hagia Sophia first. So if we look at the ground plan here, and we look at some of the curves here, we're seeing some more updated um, forms of what we saw before. So we're seeing kind of a basilica plan, but also some central planning. We see these giant domes covered with mosaic and gold. And in this case, under the dome, they put these rows of windows to get more light in. It makes things shinier. So something that really is highlighted in uh, Byzantium. We also have these pendentives, which I know we've looked at in some other things as well. Remember the pendentives are things that help to carry the weight down. So in order to support the weight of all of this, especially with all those windows, they have these triangular areas that just pull the weight down and help to support. Uh, there are also a lot of buttresses that were added. Remember those are exterior. Um, and 
those would help to support the weight. We also have minarets that are shown here. Now those things, both the buttresses and the minarets, were added when the Ottoman Empire took control of Hagia Sophia. Um, so this was, a this was a church originally, then became a mosque under the Ottoman Empire, uh, and now is actually a museum that you can go and visit. Let's talk about this map a little bit. This is uh, a map of 1000 CE. Uh, so if we look, all of the orange shows this Muslim caliphate, and then we have the Byzantine Empire here. So they do kind of come right next to each other, and you can see Constantinople's up here where Hagia Sophia is located. Um, so Muslim uh, area kind of comes around here. We also see it stretching into Spain uh, and some other areas. And so there's a big influence in this medieval world uh, with Islamic kind of uh, art forms. And we'll look at that with a couple pieces. All right, so if we start here with the Great Mosque of Cordoba, uh, this is an earlier mosque. It started with this ground plan, and then some things were added to it. So if we zoom in here just a little bit, this was a courtyard in the front, and then I'm sure by now you know what it means when you see all of these columns in a row. Yes, that's right, it's a hippostyle mosque. Uh, so large interior, but inside of there, there are all of these columns. Remember, these columns are actually spolia. They were taken from a Roman uh, structure that was there before. And they have all of these beautiful curves with the red and white, which is something that's synonymous with Spain and this uh, Islamic influence as well. So filled space with this. Um, this image and also what we see right up here are both things that indicate what happens eventually, which is that once uh, the Muslim Caliphate falls, instead the Christians come in and they actually take control and build a church on top. So it's actually when you're walking around in here, you can find the church, but it also, uh, they broke through the ceiling and added on up top just to make it a little bit taller. Okay, now if we talk about the Mosque of Salim II, this is a much later piece. This is the 16th century. Uh, and you might see some influences from a piece that we just looked at. It looks a lot like the Hagia Sophia. Uh, and the reason for that is Sinan, the architect, was really, really inspired by it and wanted to make something that was equally as beautiful, if not much, much more beautiful. So we still see that kind of central planning here. Um, if we look at the ground plan, like other mosques, it has that courtyard. And then here's that interior where it has... Um, this central dome. There are also minarets all around it. And then we also have some libraries, some schools, just other things along uh, in that structural area. You can see the red and the white in those columns uh, and the arches as well. And there's a lot of beautiful ornamentation inside. So I suggest going back and looking at some of the terminology when it comes to the uh, Islam unit that we looked at. It might be helpful um, with a little more of the detail as well. All right, moving on, Alhambra uh, in Granada. This is a palace, uh, one of the last strongholds uh, for the Muslim Caliphate. And one of the nice things about this, we've got the ground plan as well. In addition to be having a lot of interior spaces, there were a lot of these courtyards, like this courtyard of the lions that we see here, and those are indicated by these larger rectangles on the map. They did this so that they could bring a lot of light in, but they also did it so that they could um, have a lot of fountains and have all of these channels that you see in these two spaces that carry water throughout. Remember, um, an Islamic ideal is thinking about paradise and trying to bring that paradise uh, into daily life. And so by bringing all of these beautiful, beautiful uh, outdoor elements and then all of this beautiful architecture together, they're trying to mimic paradise. Remember the water moving throughout too is a way to kind of muffle noises as well in the palace. All right, moving on, we're going to talk about Romanesque style in Europe versus Gothic Europe. Uh, and there are a lot of similarities between the two. So let's start with the similarities. 
Um, during this time, we see a lot of luxury goods, illuminated manuscripts. We'll look at four. Uh, we see carved ivory, uh, a lot of different things made out of carved ivory. We also see a lot of enamel and filigree work. So think small scale metal, uh, adding color to it, really, really detailed and ornamental and functional a lot of times. Uh, a big thing with Romanesque and Gothic Europe is pilgrimages. People are traveling to different churches as uh, far, far away, and they're doing so to see relics, things that, things that belonged to saints or parts of of saints um, and also to worship so it's a way to kind of prove your devotion and also um, kind of gain some luck or some prayer through this process we're seeing a lot of cruciform style churches uh, remember the cruciform style it's that basilica plan so that rectangle but then they add a crossbar across which is called the transept so think of the style of a cross cruciform uh, and that's the type of church that are now being built a lot of them have, or most of them have, ambulatories with radiating chapels. Um, the ambulatory is the place where you're walking, which we'll, I'll show you, and the radiating chapels would be places where relics would be placed so you could visit them. And then a ton use sculptures, uh, especially around portals and doors, places where they can put a lot of ornamental detail to kind of tell the Christian story. All right, Let's look at Romanesque. So 11th and 12th century versus Gothic 12th and 13th. So Romanesque is a little before. We see really thick walls with Romanesque. And then in the Gothic Europe style, they start to thin out higher roofs so it feels less um, thick and enclosed. We have barrel vaulting with Romanesque. And then we have groin vaulting specifically with pointed arches in Gothic Europe. So here's a little depiction of our barrel vaulting. Here is our groin vaulting, just more complex system. Romanesque dark interiors, it's a little lighter with Gothic. Um, there are also flying buttresses on Gothic European cathedrals um, versus just regular buttresses on Romanesque, meaning if they're flying, there's negative space underneath. We have churches in Romanesque, and then they upgrade to cathedrals in Gothic Europe. Um, also, there's a lot of stained glass and light in Gothic European churches. This is a way to kind of take away some of the heaviness in the wall uh, and open up the space. We have more abstraction and stylization in Romanesque Europe. And then in Gothic Europe, we start to see more naturalism. Uh, also with Gothic Europe, there's this uh, development in the cult of the Virgin Mary. So we see tons more images of the Virgin Mary. Uh, she becomes a character that uh, people really uh, are devoted to in Christianity. All right, so let's put all of that information to use here. Here we have the Church of Saint Foy. Uh, we have our ground plan here. Remember, this is the cruciform form. We have the transept that goes across. We have the nave in the middle with the apse at the end. Then this area going around is our ambulatory. It's so that if there's a service going on, people could enter and they could go around. They could stop at these radiating chapels and view relics, pray to them, and then they could go about their way. This is an example of a relic reliquary. Uh, it's just a really, really ornate structure that would hold a relic. Uh, this specific reliquary has so many gemstones and details that are all spolia that people would actually bring and leave with the reliquary um, in honor of it. And so they were slowly added to the sculpture. Here we have our exterior. You can see there are windows, but it's pretty limited. Even this uh, circular window, it's very small. When we look at the interior, we see those barrel vaults. And you can see that it's very, very heavy, dark, um, not a lot of imagery and just heavy walls. There was a lot of imagery on the above the portal. This is the tympanum right above the door when you enter. So this one is something that you could see on the exam as well. This is the tympanum of the last judgment. So it's the scene where uh, someone is being judged on whether they would get into heaven or not. And I bet if you think about it, you could think about why this would be featured um, here. Think of it as a teaching tool, something that kind of scares people, uh, but also makes them think about their morality and the importance of their uh, Christian faith. So when you enter, this is what you really should be thinking of, um, your own morality and will you get into heaven or not. Heavy topic right there. All right, uh, one other Romanesque piece before we move on to Gothic. This is the Bayou Tapestry. So this is an English Romanesque work. Uh, so 
the reason it's considered Romanesque is it's got flat colors, patterns, and it's more stylized, more abstracted. Um, it's very different than the architectural pieces that we just saw, but we are seeing some more simplistic uh, approaches. Uh, this is a narrative commemorating uh, the Norman invasion of England. It's a continuous narrative, so we see characters continue throughout. It's huge. It's also interesting because it's embroidered. It's very much like a frieze that we might have seen on the Parthenon. Um, there's also an abstracted animal border that goes around, which is something that is very common in uh, medieval um, depictions. All right, Gothic U Europe. Um, for this cathedral that we're looking at, uh, I can show you a couple other things. We still have this uh, transept that goes across. So we have the cruciform uh, style church. This one's much more intense. All these X's indicate all of these points of these groin vaults. So this is much more complex, but it can support a lot more weight. And you might notice here it feels a little bit more open. There's a lot more stained glass on the side uh, to let light in, and they're able to make it a lot taller. So now we're not making churches, we're doing more cathedrals, these really, really grand, grand structures. Uh, and this is something that they would add on to for long periods of time. So the Chartres uh, Cathedral actually has uh, a early Gothic and then a high Gothic uh, facade. So some of the facades are different. I wanted to highlight here what you can see. These are actually the flying buttresses. So they're supports on the outside that hold up those walls. And then we have our beautiful rose window here letting in tons of light. We also still see over the portals tons and tons of decoration and sculpture along with jam figures that kind of stand along the sides. Here we have stained glass view of uh, the Virgin Mary. Remember the relic, uh, the main relic of this cathedral was a like a nightdress that they believe that the Virgin Mary wore um, after giving birth to Christ. All right, continuing with Gothic Europe, uh, we have one of our illuminated manuscripts here. Uh, and then we also have the Rotkin Pieta. Um, this piece is one that's very emotional, uh, stylized, but to make you really devoted, make you really um, feel the suffering that Christ is going through. The uh, moralized Bible here that we have, we see, well, you know what, I'm going to talk about it more when we get to our um, illuminated manuscripts. But if you want to see the similarities with Gothic Europe, take a look at this area here, this page. It looks a lot like stained glass, and we're also seeing a big use of the gold. Uh, but we'll talk about that more with illuminated manuscripts. All right, the Moravian loop fibulae and the Pyxis that we've looked at. So we do see some Islamic influence here. Both of them I put together because they both use horror vacui, basically having tons and tons of ornamentation, so it's almost overwhelming. They both use zoomorphic forms. I'd say more so with the Moravian fibulae. If you look closely, there are different details that actually look like animals. So in this case, we have some fish here, uh, but they're very uh, abstracted. And this would be a great example of enamel and filigree. So lots of small filigree um, metal and then using color in between as well as some gemstones. These would have been worn objects. Uh, we see something very similar to it that Justinian's wearing in the uh, panel in San Vital. All right, so illuminated manuscripts as promised. We have the Vienna Genesis, which has two different scenes, Rebecca and Elysia at the whale at the well and Jacob wrestling the angel. Remember these um, images would have helped illiterate people understand what was going on above. This was all done on vellum. In this case it was dyed purple even though it looks kind of orangey here. And it's also examples of continuous narration. So the woman in pink here, Rebecca, is shown twice but it's the same story. So we have it kind of wrapping around. Same thing with this story here. Lots of iconography and um, importance in the details, so it might be worth you going back and revisiting on your own if you forget some of the details of that story. All right, then if we move on to the Lindisfarne Gospels, which was the 8th century. So first we have 6th century with Vienna Genesis, now we're in the 8th century. You see that stylistically things have changed. Once again, they're using this to educate the illiterate. 
um, and also to uh, record Christian stories. Remember, these books were made by hand uh, by monks, uh, so very, very detailed, and if they made a mistake, they would completely throw that away um, and start over. So you can imagine the detail and the ornamentation. This is a carpet page. It's got that uh, cruciform uh, structure. Also, if you look really closely, I don't think I can zoom in anymore on this, but there's a lot of zoomorphic uh, animal type abstract imagery, which is very common of this medieval time. Then we have the St. Luke insipid page, basically the first page, and then we have the portrait page, kind of shows some of the detail. You notice that this is pretty abstracted. This is a little more Romanesque um, and stylized versus more naturalistic, which they eventually get. All right, then we have the Golden Haggadah. Remember, this is a, it's basically our only Jewish work. Um, and a Haggadah is a narrative that's used and accompanied, accompanies the Passover meal. So it's got a lot of different stories, um, biblical stories that help to, um, that you can look through and kind of get some imagery on. So let's zoom in. We have the plagues of Egypt. We have the scenes of liberation and the preparation for Passover. So within each of these, we have a beautiful gold background. We're seeing a little more architecture and a little bit more movement in the characters. We're seeing, if you look at the drapes, there's a little more detail there. They're still abstracted though, uh, not super realistic. An interesting thing about this Haggadah is that there were multiple different artists, probably two or three that did it. So some of the style changed depending on which artist um, did those pages. Okay, and then lastly, we have the Moralized Bible, which is 13th century. Uh, so later, both of these, 14th and 13th century, much later than the earlier two that we just looked at. We have the dedication page with Blanche of Castile, and then we have um, the scenes from the apocalypse. So the interesting thing about this Moralized Bible, other than we see the Gothic stained glass influence, uh, is that all of a sudden we're seeing a shift from profession or from monastic workers from monasteries to professional workers so now they're employing people um, for this purpose it has biblical te texts but then it also has commentary and the commentary relates to the medieval time period so it relates to people and things that people would understand during that time period it's a way to make it more approachable and this was something that the Blanche of Castile um, she had commissioned for her son. It was like a gift for him as he's growing up. Um, yeah, so lots and lots of detail. We see ornamentation with this abstracted kind of city behind it, uh, but I like showing those four all together because you see 6th century, 8th century, 13th century, and 14th century, how styles shift and change um, over time. All right, so lastly, things you need to think about. Medieval, it's seen as primitive, the Dark Ages, why? Okay, ask yourself if you can answer that. How have styles shifted from ancient Mediterranean to this medieval period? How has architecture changed, church and cathedrals? And then what is depicted in sculpture, painting, and stained glass? Why has that shifted? All right, thanks guys, have a great one.